Are you there? Today we're going to have a look at Scotland and as you can see I have plenty of maps and little brochures that have turned up in my postbook the last one turned up just this morning, by the way, so just in time for this video from Jack. And then I got a couple from Giacomo. And I think there was a third set as well, but I've kind of lost track a bit, I have to admit. Either way, thank you so much for all of this info here. There's some really beautiful pieces, but plenty to get through. And I think we're going to put this one aside for today and have a look at this one instead. I'd love to start with Orkney and the Shetland Islands. Orkney was in the newspaper the other day. I thought it was a little note. Um, suggesting that Orkney might break away at some point from Scotland and Great Britain. and instead join Norway. But I think it was more a, an idea that's going around at the moment without any concrete plans. But it made international news. I thought it was an interesting piece of information and so I got curious. The Orkney Islands are here. On the northernmost tip of Scotland, as you can see here, south of the Pentland Firth would be the mainland. And then here are the Orkney Islands, 70 all together, and 20 of them are inhabited by about 20,000 people. And the largest place is Kirkwall, here, on an island that generally referred to as mainland. And you can see there's plenty of places all along the island. Orkney has been inhabited for at least 8,500 years, maybe longer. There were a lot of glaciers, not just here in the north, but generally in Scotland. And some traces might not be visible anymore. They can't be found because of the changes that the glaciers brought with them to the landscape. The Picts lived here, or more generally in the northern part of Scotland. And then starting in the 8th century, you had a lot of Norwegian influence. And there was one of the um, arguments that was brought in the article, that the Orkney Islands are actually closer to Oslo rather than to London and that 
the way that faraway places are incorporated into Norway seems more desirable than the way this happens in Great Britain. I think it's a good idea to get at the atlas for a moment so we can have a look at that. we have a map of Europe and we can see the Orkney Islands right here Shetney Islands a bit further north and then Oslo would be here still a fair way and then to London all the way down there Of course, there is some common history with the Orkney Islands and the Shetney Islands with Norway. In both places, you had speakers of an old uh, Germanic language that disappeared at some point in the 19th century called Norn, which was closely related to uh, the West Scandinavian languages, so Icelandic, Norwegian, Faroese. And the language eventually got replaced by Scots and then by Scottish English. But we have the fairies here. Plenty of them both between the islands and we can also go from Kirkwall to either Aberdeen in six to eight hours or to Lurwick in five to seven hours and for that we jump here to the right side of the map Lurwick's here the largest place of the Shetland Islands. Well, the Orkney Islands are separated from Scotland by a Firth of about 16 kilometers or 10 miles. It's more than 10 times the distance for the Shetland Islands. We're looking at 170 kilometers or 110 miles to Scotland and they are roughly the border between the Atlantic and the North Sea on the other side and here we're quite far north so if we want to go to Aberdeen it's going to take 13 hours and if we want to go to Norway to Bergen it's 14 hours, so it's really roughly the same distance, same time it takes to travel there. Kirkwall, we've already seen. Five to seven hours. And then this one here is also interesting. Fair Isle, four hours. They added it here. In this little corner. Tiny little island with a lighthouse in the north and one on the south, which is somewhere in between the Shetland and the Orkney Islands out there in the sea. The Shetland Islands are also inhabited by about 22,000 people, so same as the Orkney Islands. And again, you have a lot of uh, Scandinavian influence. Many of the place names have Norse origins, like here, Grunasand, Hamnavo, Skalaway. 
I'm not actually sure how the pronunciation has evolved here. I am sure if you're local, there's a very distinct way to pronounce this name, these names. With the history of the languages and how they evolved from one to the other in this remote place. Most famous about the Shetland Islands might be the Shetland ponies. We actually had one in the stable where I learned horse riding. They're great for kids because they're quite small and very strong. But I also feel like small ponies like that, they always have a mind of their own. They're a little stubborn. But not mean, I might add. You just have to be a little careful. of languages, the uh, languages of the island are called Injila Scots. Uh, Scots is a sister language of English. They both developed from early Middle English and diverged from there. So they still have a lot of similarities and of course whether something is classified as a language or a dialect is always dependent on the specific circumstances of a place but Scots generally is classified as a language and then of course when it comes to English you have a specific standard in Scotland that is different from the one further south in England or different from the one in Ireland, the US, or Canada. So I mentioned earlier that in the north of Scotland, it's going to be over here, Shetlands, Orkneys, the Highlands, or the Hebrides, in the north you had the kingdom of the Pickets. They most likely spoke a Gaelic language, but we're not quite sure what that language was like. And they merged eventually with the kingdom of Dalariata, which was located here along the coastline in Argyll basically means coast of the Gales and that became the Kingdom of Scotland in the Middle Ages and here you can see it says this is Scotland and it says Alva and there's a, a funny little detail to that so the Scot part here of Scotland comes from Latin. The Romans called basically people they encountered in Ireland uh, Scotians. And that is probably related to the word meaning something like darkness or gloom. Um, so it tells us a little bit about how the Romans saw those people on the islands as probably different and a little dangerous maybe. In the Middle Ages, Scotland eventually was used for what we think of today as Scotland rather than Ireland. So we have this origin meaning darkness, gloominess. Alba, on the other hand, Arp is related to the word that um, we have for the Alps, for example, for the mountains. 
And if you think of the mountains, they have these snowy peaks, they are white and shining, and Alba and Alps have their origin in a word that ultimately means white. So there's a bit of a contrast there, maybe in how people saw their own land and how the Romans saw it when they visited. We've looked at some parts of Scotland before, most notably Isla and Jura. I think it was two years ago when I celebrated, I don't remember whether it was a thousand or five thousand subscribers. It feels like ages ago. You can see that the water is a big part, pretty much all of these pictures. We have the Isle of Staffa and Fingal's Cave, Box Glen. This looks really lovely. I'd love to go for a hike there. Some good food with a lot of fresh seafood, of course. So that's not so much my thing. But I'm sure if you enjoy like shellfish or oysters, you'd be quite happy there. We have a bit of an overview, some practical information. Then I think there was a map in here somewhere. Let's just have a quick look. So I think this is a bit of a better size to show you the area. Let's just make a bit of space. There we go. So we have the north of Scotland here with the Outer Hebrides. And Isle of Louise and Harris, the Isle of Skye, we have the Highlands here with Inverness, and to the north we can see again the Orkneys and the Shetland Islands, and we have a lot of places called Firth here. It's not quite the same as a fjord, but the words are related. It's a kind of inlet. Uh, sometimes it can have brackish water where it turned um, the mouth of a river into an estuary through the tides, so it widened. But it can also be what we think of when we mean a fjord, so just an inlet of the sea. And that was all caused by the glaciers that changed the land. The lakes here are called Loch, which is related to the word lake. I think not easy to pronounce if you're uh, 
English speaker. And here we have the south of Scotland. So you can see quite nicely here from the colours, the shades of brown, darker ones here, that means that the land is elevated, and where it's green, the land is lower. And this is generally referred to as the central belt. That is where most people live in Scotland. The capital is Edinburgh, but the largest city is Glasgow. Both have roughly half a million inhabitants. And it's been thought that maybe this area is going to kind of grow together. So all of these places in between are going to form a large urban area. The third largest city is here further north, Aberdeen. With about 200,000 inhabitants and Dundee has about 150,000 places like Perth or Inverness, which we've mentioned earlier, have less than 50,000 inhabitants. Generally, you have the sea around Scotland, the North Sea, here we go out to the Atlantic, here we have the Irish Sea, across to Belfast. And here further south, we also have the Isle of Man. And then here's the border to England, which is a land border. And you would drive down to Newcastle upon Tyne in Sunderland. As next largest cities here on the western coast, you have Carlisle. And again, plenty of firths. The Firth of Forth, the Solway Firth, the Firth of Clyde, and so on. And in here we also have some Edwards with some Harris tweed and Jack sent me this really cute uh, keyring. This is hand woven cloth Harris tweed from the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. 100% pure new wool. And I really like this combination of colors. It looks like a field in summer. And then you have this really fine white coat. Almost a bit silvery. And if you turn it around, it almost looks a bit like a lion with the eyes here and a funny 80s haircut. Here's another regional map of the west coast, but 
Fata Safa we have Yura and Ayla. And I kind of really love this map here. It tells you about the wildlife like red deer and wild goats right here are the deer looking out from the hills you also have seals everywhere along the coastline together with otters and up here Maybe also a whale. But I think the focus of this map is more on the different whiskey distilleries. That are listed here. All along the island. Each one with a different image, or oh, almost each one. Here we have some similar ones. But all with their variation. They're sometimes mentioned as such, but you do have a land connection. And I really like the style of this map as well. All the details that you can find. Both wildlife and buildings and ferries or boats. Right here we have some chess pieces. They're quite famous. You might have seen them before. They're from Walrus Ivory. From the 12th century. They were only found in the 19th century. Most of them are in London, in the British Museum. But you can also see some of them in Scotland in the National Museum up here we have the standing stones of Callanish They're about 5,000 years old and it was probably a ritual site back in the Bronze Age but it's 
difficult to say and since they're quite old and have eroded a bit they've seen a lot of weather changes they might not be aligned anymore the way they used to so it's difficult to say what rituals exactly might have happened there by the way, there are 13 stones put together in a circle. One legend has it that these were old giants of the island that refused to convert to Christianity. And it gives us an idea either way how long people have been living on these islands. Right here you also have a Norse mill and a kill. Since you had plenty of Scandinavian presence in the area. And of course, also plenty of old churches. And Jack told me a little bit about what life was like on the islands until back in the 90s. When, for example, you couldn't take a ferry off the islands on Sunday as it was a day of rest and everything was closed that sounds quite familiar actually to what life is like here but you can get on a train and you can get on a ferry by now on Sundays he sent two more postcards one of the harbour on the Isle of Ruiz and one of the castle he said back in the 90s it was boarded up but you couldn't visit it but it was reopened in 2016-2017 and you can go visit it now this one's not as old though it's from the mid 19th century so it's a Victorian building Hope you enjoyed this little exploration of the different maps of Scotland and it's helped you fall asleep. I will see you again next week. Good night.